Uh, so today I want to talk about Studebakers. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Studebaker Motor Corporation was the very last American car company in all of history, past or future, to die an honest death. In December of 1963, they ceased production in America. They continued manufacturing engines in South Bend, Indiana, as the cars moved to Hamilton, Ontario. Um, Hamilton, Ontario later switched to Chevy engines in an attempt to continue manufacturing the Studebakers without them. Um, so th when you do an engine switchover, of course, you don't want the automotive union to find out in advance. So they did this as a surprise, and they kept manufacturing engines that they knew they wouldn't need. So what do they do with the engines? Well, they exported them. All of the V8s went to South Africa, and all of the V6s went to Haifa, and they continued manufacturing Israeli Studebakers until the late 60s. If you happen to know where I could buy one of these, please let me know. So um, when, I, when I bought the car, uh, I actually started with this one. This is a blue 1964 Studebaker Cruiser that was manufactured in 63. It's from the very last year they did American production. And um, it had been sitting in a basement since 1981. And if you really want to learn how your car works, you should drive one that has been in a basement since 1981 because all of the rubber has collapsed on it and everything will break. And in repairing that, you'll understand how all of the pieces of the machine work. Right? Until you take this apart, you never really understood uh, what's inside of it. The, um, the way that it's arranged is cool, too. Um, a full third of the dash is consumed by the clock because this was back in that era when they kept adding clocks to uh, all of the, the home appliances. Beneath the radio, those uh, fins, that's the air conditioning. And the, um, the cooling uh, unit, like the, the evaporator, is actually right behind those. And you can stick your finger in and freeze your finger on the evaporating fins. And best of all, they have these books. They have a collected shop manual that you can buy. And you know, these two volumes explain everything about those series of cars. Uh, of course, I bought the wrong year, so I had to get an updated shop manual. But the, um, you know, the engine, the, the carburetor, the brakes, the power steering, the air conditioning, all of that is described in sufficient detail that you could repair it as it breaks. And you were sort of expected to do a lot of this maintenance yourself. The idea that your car was uh, like a sealed magical box whose lid must never be opened didn't exist at this time. That's a, a more modern invention. Um, there are some cars that are actually designed with a fail-safe switch, like nuclear missiles, so that no one man can open the car on his own. Right? You need two people to sit and um, they have like these uh, straps, one by the driver's left foot, one by the passenger's right foot. And they both have to be pulled backward, not inward, but backward, in order for the hood to pop open. Because if they didn't do that, then you might lift the hood on your own car and see something that you're not supposed to see. And this is ridiculous. So I, I, after catching the Studebaker bug on the blue one, I wanted one that ran more reliably. Uh, I was in Seattle visiting uh, a buddy of mine, and uh, he found this on Craigslist, and he told me that, I, that if I didn't buy it, he was going to buy it. So we both go to the bank, we both withdraw the asking price, and then we road trip down to Portland, and I bought it first. Um, this is also a 1964 Studebaker Cruiser, also a 289 V8 engine, uh, also power steering, also power brakes, um, also disc brakes in the front. Um, this does not have the air conditioning model, or the air conditioning option, which I really regret because I drove it here yesterday, and um, Alabama summers can be a little bit toasty. Yeah, yeah, that's mine out in the parking lot. Um, and there are other cool things, like um, it turns out that if you drive a cool car, cops won't pull you over for having a license plate that's 55 years out of date. <laughs> Um, the, the, when I bought the blue one, I had no license plate at all, but uh, like I said, the rubber was starting to go on it. And um, there's a little hose that runs the pressurized oil from the engine up to the oil pressure gauge on your dash. 
because they, they didn't want to have like an electronic sensor and then forward it to the dash. They actually run the pressurized oil to the dash of the car in order to tell you what the oil pressure is. And um, when I bought the car, I was warned that it had a serious oil leak that the guy hadn't identified yet. And it turned out that it was that little hose. Um, so as we were driving it home from South Carolina to Tennessee, there was a, a giant plume of uh, blue smoke coming out behind us. Every time we stopped for gas, we'd also add a gallon of oil. <laughs> and thanks to this plume, the police never noticed that I didn't have a license plate at all. Uh, which is technically legal if you buy a car on a Sunday in uh, South Carolina. But I didn't want to have to explain that and then get the car started again. Um, and, the, you know, they, they clean up really well. They're, uh, they're fun to drive. Um, so my brother got one. And um, his didn't have an oil pressure gauge that he trusted. He wanted it to have real units. So he wired this one up in the, in the left, and what it showed was that the engine can't keep oil pressure. So the other thing that you learn with these delightful cars is that some of them uh, are not things that you can repair anymore, that there are things that are beyond you. But also, the, the things that are beyond your ability to repair are few and far between if you're sufficiently stubborn about it. Um, I, I guarantee you that within five years, he'll get this car running. Um, you also start to notice them in public more often. This is a 62 Lark that I found around Knoxville. Um, this is a, a rat rod that I found a few blocks away from that. Um, and then this one, um, so the, the day before yesterday was International Drive Your Studebaker Day. Uh, show of hands, who celebrated? Oh, come on. So this had been parked across the street from a friend of mine who had a housewarming party the same day. Um, and the nice thing about driving a Studebaker is that even in a place where every homeowner is armed, you can still just pull into some random stranger's driveway and knock on the door. And uh, as soon as they see the car, they smile. The guy came out, showed me this. This is um, a 62 Studebaker Daytona convertible. Uh, and the, the top still comes down and the thing still runs. A um, little bit of hail damage, so you should park these things indoors. And again, these two books describe everything that you need to repair that car. If the steering goes out, if the brakes go out, all of that is described in these books. It shows you how to uh, properly lubricate the mechanism that raises and lowers the windows so that you don't get a squeaking sound when you roll them up or down. Everything is in these books. And you also get to learn a bit about modern technology through these things. So um, what happened there? Modern technology. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Yeah, yell it out. All right, what kind of distributor? Yell it out. All right, uh, Skyler cheated, but it is a Hall Effect distributor. So the, the original distributors in these things had points. Uh, a point is a piece of metal that sticks up, and there's another piece of metal that swings by and hits it. And when it hits it, it connects the circuit, which allows the high voltage from the ignition coil to run to the spark plug. Um, and this is great because it lets your car run, but this is bad in other ways because, um, well, first of all, there's also a small spark here, even as there's a longer spark inside of the engine. And that, that small spark uh, limits the voltage that your ignition coil can use. Because if your ignition coil is higher voltage, then you wind up with two long sparks, and your distributor wears down faster. So they managed to recreate this using Hall effect transistors and a magnet. So that as it spins, the transistor conducts, there is no spark, and your voltage can be a lot higher because there's no um, spark outside of the engine. You then have a, a single point of ignition. Um, and you, you can rip the distributor out of your old engine, and you can upgrade it this way. Um, it, it did freak me out a little bit that I went from a car with five transistors to one with 13. But I, I'm coming to terms with modern technology. Um, but we're here today to talk about radios, not about cars, however beautiful they might be, um, or how, how ugly they might be in the modern day when you can't tell the difference between uh, a Škoda and a Toyota. Um, it, did any of you assemble these kits as kids? Yep. All right, cool. So the way that these work 
is that it's got the, um, the schematic diagram on the PCB, and you just sort of fill in the part where it tells you to put the part. So um, C3 is a capacitor, you just sort of stick that in, you solder it from the other side, and the instructions are a part of the PCB, so it's sort of hard to get lost. Um, and, you know, when you tell someone that you built a radio as a kid, that was really impressive until they see that it's a board and you're effectively painting by number. Um, so this was the first radio that I made more than a thousand of. This was the badge from the Next Hope Conference in New York. Um, this uses an MSP430 microcontroller and an NRF 24L01 plus radio. And the uh, NRF radio is cool because it's also used in Microsoft wireless keyboards. Um, the radio isn't supposed to have a promiscuous mode, but I found uh, a test setting that allowed me to create one. So I was able to listen to keyboard traffic as a software patch to these conference badges. Um, now, like, by one way of thinking, these are very different things. This is like paint by number, and you're just sort of like putting the components where you're told to. Um, and then this is modern electronics, right? This is a sophisticated surface mount design. This has uh, all the things in the right place. Um, until you realize that the manufacturers helpfully provide you with reference designs that tell you where the hell to stick everything. So a lot of these things that look like there's magic behind them are things that the component manufacturers will helpfully teach you how to do. You can sort of uh, grab a shop manual for it. Um, if you don't want to solder much, um, you can grab these pre-built radios everywhere. Every manufacturer of a chip also has some cheap little board that you can buy. Um, this is a, an AVR feather wing from Adafruit. Right? You go on Adafruit, you grab one of these, you attach it to an antenna, and you have a radio. Uh, you also attach it to a power supply, and you have uh, an unattended repeater. You can send out um, a, a beacon from a rooftop, um, this was repeating LoRa packets in Philadelphia, and I never took it down when I moved. So as, as far as I know, there's still uh, <laughs> a small LoRa network running in West Philly. And you learn things by doing these practical little kits just as much as you do when you do things in bulk. The, um, you know, from, uh, from this configuration, I learned that the... Um, that the 433 megahertz ISM band is crowded as hell, right? Um, I also learned that the, um, the AVR is a lot nicer about suffering a bad power supply than the ARM microcontrollers are. So um, this particular station was originally made with an ARM Cortex-M0. And I had this problem that um, during the winter, there isn't that much direct sunlight. Um, you've heard from the prophetic TV show that it's always sunny in Philadelphia, but this is a lie. And when, the, uh, when you have four or five days without direct sunshine, um, you can watch the graph of the available voltage just crash down to nothing. The, um, when that happens, you know, ideally, uh, the next day will be sunny and your equipment should come back up. And what you find is that the ARM chips from Atmel, their, their Cortex-M0 series, they will get stuck in the bootloader and they will never continue further. Because as they glitch out trying to turn their LED on from an insufficient power supply that is rising, they stay in that bootloader state thinking that you're trying to recover them by mashing the reset button. Whereas the AVRs have a timeout. They figure that if you're not using the bootloader within four or five uh, seconds, that you're not intending to use the bootloader. And they continue on and boot the main application. So you can build these standalone repeaters using a, a cheap Arduino hardware, Arduino software, but your choice of components still matters. What pieces are under the hood, what, what's running in the mask ROM of your microcontroller will determine whether this lasts for a month or for years. Um, 
This is also why you should get into ham radio, even if you don't intend to spend your days talking about diabetes on the local repeaters. <laughs> because the, um, you know, for, for all of the, the jokes that you can make uh, about the ham radio community, fewer than 85% of which are deserved, the, um, the things that you learn by actually installing an antenna and setting up a station and then keeping reliable communications running from it are things that would be useful to you as you're doing software-defined radio or as you're doing other projects, even if they're unrelated to the ham radio bands or licensing. Um, so this black antenna on the Studebaker is um, a dual-band NMO mount that we installed. We ran the, um, the cable underneath the carpets. It's just perfectly blended into the upholstery, comes out in the passenger footwell. Uh, we mounted the control for the, the Kenwood radio on the ashtray um, so that we could do it without marring the, um, the dashboard. Uh, we also installed one in my blue Studebaker, and as, the, uh, as my brother's Studebakers begin running, we're going to hook them up and get him a license. So the, when you're playing around with these projects, you shouldn't really be concerned with whether the individual project is sophisticated or like uh, at a hobby grade, because one easily leads to the other and teaches you things to go back and forth. As I'm making devices that are professionally, as I'm making uh, electronics that I intend to do commercially or in high volume, you know, I'm sure as shit going to test those bootloaders to see what happens to them when a weak power supply has a rising voltage. Because I, I've seen how difficult it is to get Atmel's Cortex-M0 series running reliably in my rooftop repeater. Even in Arduino code, that same bug is going to crop up in more professional devices. And I'm also rather impressed at the design decision on the AVR side to fall through the bootloader and begin running the main application if it looks like it's doing the wrong thing. So uh, do any of you remember this device? It came out in like, uh, 2008. Uh, I believe it was announced at the TI Developers Conference, but it might have come out a year earlier. This is the TI Kronos Watch. Um, and with the rest of my time, I'd like to share with you a, a project that I've built as a sort of um, modern rewrite of this reference design. Um, so uh, this watch contains a 70 centimeter or 33 centimeter radio, uh, as well as an antenna. Um, it runs on a, a coin cell battery. It has an MSP430 microcontroller in it. There are a couple of problems with it, though. Um, it's very uncomfortable. Like, um, I know uh, a, a lot of radio folks who were really keen to play with these things, and they got one, and they couldn't, for the life of them, continue wearing the thing because it was so um, awful. Like, the, the band will catch sweat inside of it, um, and then it sort of squirts out like a squirt gun in the summer uh, because it has no way to dry. The... Um, as these were initially manufactured, there's a, a bug in the real-time clock. Um, and because of that bug, they couldn't keep accurate time, and you couldn't accurately set the time. Um, but this is a particularly malicious bug. This bug only crops up by um, not the least significant couple of bits, but a, little, a few bits higher of the program counter address at the moment that the clock is updated. So when you've got your linker script that's putting your, um, your time module later in the, in the design uh, as you're, you're compiling your firmware, any change in code prior to that will hide the bug by changing the alignment so that you don't hit it anymore. So no matter what you change, you think that you fixed the bug until the next time it crops up. And um, the, the programming modules for this required that you um, take the watch out of the case and then attach it to the programming board, um, or risk doing an over-the-air update through a, a special radio bootloader. Um, so it became very hard to write software for this experimentally. You had to sort of have all of the code working and then port it over. So I came up with this, which is a clone of Casio's 3208 watch module that I call the Good Watch. 
Um, this uses the same ChipCon 430 RF chip that the, um, uh, the Chronos watch used, um, except that it fits within a comfortable commercial case. So you can wear it all day long. You can have like a proper band attached. Um, the way that you do this is you begin by figuring out how the original worked. So um, if your module is going to fit where theirs is, if you're copying a commercial product as a reference design, you begin by measuring the board and then sort of sketching out the mechanical dimensions, um, where each part goes. And then you can draft up a, a sort of testing board. This lacks any radio components. The only purpose of, of this revision of the board is to tell when the, uh, to, sorry, to verify that the LCD pins are connected correctly and the buttons and the power. The chip used in this is the ChipCon 430 F6137. You've got 32K of flash, 4K of SRAM. It's got a 96 segment LCD controller, which is not quite as many segments as the watch physically has. So you sort of have to um, figure out how to make it fit. Uh, it has a sub gigahertz radio, and it has a bootloader ROM that allows you to program it over a serial port so that you don't necessarily need to have a JTAG adapter in order to program it. The, um, the LCD was reverse engineered by um, taking the original LCD. Now, I, I don't have as many pins as they have, but in the data sheet for my chip, I'm told that the control lines go here and the segment lines go over there. The control lines, there are four of them, they sort of wiggle with an AC signal as the segment lines are running in order to uh, form an array for each pixel. So the way that you figure out which ones you can safely ignore is that you open up your old watch, as shown here on the right, and you put sticky notes over the pins that you don't quite have enough to manage and then you put the original board back into the case and you watch which segments die. So um, this being uh, like my view from my own CAD software, uh, which has the same layout for the LCD as the original, um, I just sort of cover up the, um, the far four pins on the left. Those are all of the control lines. When I do that, all of the pixels in the LCD die off because every segment needs to be balanced against a control pin. The same effect could be had if you block off all of the segment pins. So then again, you know, causing selective failures in order to know which pins are safe to not connect. If I block off this pin, one quarter of the pixels die. And if I need all of those, or if I need any of those, then that's not a pin that I can safely disconnect. I then move my little piece of sticky note over to the right and plug it back in to see what's failed a second time, and a third, and a fourth. And when I do it this fourth time, I find that the fourth control pin is not actually necessary, and then I can run the LCD on only three of them. Eventually, I found that with the sticky notes in the configuration on the right, I have blocked off a couple of the pins that I would like to have, um, but that are not strictly necessary, and that means that I can successfully drive the display. If I couldn't have driven the display, I would have had to choose a different watch casing, a different LCD, or a different microcontroller. And by this trick, you can figure all of the effects of the LCD out from the original hardware before you actually lay out your own circuit board. Now, after you've laid it out, you need to write a driver for it. Just like the paint by numbers radio design, the chip manufacturer provides you with code examples for how to turn the LCD on, for how to adjust the contrast, and for how to control the individual segments. In, um, in this photograph here, I've lit every pixel that I can light up. And then this provides me with uh, a map of every pixel that I need to support within my LCD driver. Um, which becomes as simple as um, C preprocessor definitions that write to memory mapped I.O. addresses in order to flip those pixels on or turn them off. 
The chip even supports uh, double buffering. So you've got two LCD buffers, and you can flip back and forth between them in order to do passive or background animations. I then come up with a, a mapping that goes from the, um, the physical position to the, um, uh, in, ugh, sorry, I lost my, lost my thread. Um, I then come up with a mapping that produces the, um, the combination of pins, the, the offset into the buffer, and then the bit that needs to be set in order to flick on uh, an LCD segment so that I can go directly from um, a character or a byte into seeing that on the display in the given position. Um, so here we've got, as each row, we have one of the eight segments of the digit. And then, um, sorry, each row is a digit, and then each column is the segment of that digit. So the uh, A segments are all in that far left column. The decimal points are all in the far right. Um, the, the software can then be composed using a regular C compiler. Um, the MSP430 GCC compiler is routed into the, um, like to produce um, a linked image, which gets loaded into the board just like you would load in any other development board. The, um, the key matrix is arranged just like in any other cheap electronics device, just like the, the pink pager from years ago. You've got rows and you have columns, and by pushing a button, you are connecting a row to a column. So each, each I.O. port, um, I.O. port 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, those are all GPIO pins on the microcontroller, which then run out to a particular row in the, the matrix. And when you see that one GPIO pin is connected to another, that's a key press that you can then report to the software library. Um, and you do this through um, a, a map in which the low byte of the 16-bit word is the actual character that needs to be returned, and the high byte of the 16-bit word is the, um, the key scan code, which tells you which pin was connected to which other. You also need to take care of uh, your power consumption when you're developing something like this, because if you have a watch whose battery dies in days or weeks, then it winds up in a drawer until it can be recharged. What you'd really like is to be able to copy the manufacturer's original lifetime. Um, actually, show of hands, how many of you recharge your watch every day? OK. So um, TI makes an energy trace JTAG programmer that allows you to sort of like um, run your code and then also record how much current consumption the chip had for each step of your code. Um, and from this, I found that if I ran the chip at 32 kilohertz, it consumed about 5 microamps. This jumps to 160 when the chip is running at 1 megahertz. And if I run it at, at 1 megahertz just for the time that I need to update the display and then immediately go back to sleep until the next interrupt, I can drop this to 3 microamps, which gives me 3 years of battery life on the original coin cell from the watch. So you can fit insane power budgets if you just take the time to measure the power consumption of the device that you're programming. You can also do uh, applications for these things. So I have a reverse Polish notation calculator, which runs using the, the regular display, the regular inputs. Um, I have a, an alarm. Uh, so that it can uh, wake me up in the morning. It also, um, the alarm beeps out in Morse code so that you can hear the time, uh, even in the dark. There's a, a hex editor. And a hex editor is cool because often when you're designing something like this, um, it will fail. And you'll need to diagnose it on the individual device without connecting it to test hardware. So. I was, um, I was in Budapest, and my watch started showing the wrong time. It began to lose minutes per day, and I didn't know why. So using the hex editor, 
and the data sheet, the data sheet shown in the background. This is from the CC430 family guide, which provides you with every register in this chip and its function and what the bit fields mean, all of them. From there, I found the register that should contain the error code of the real-time clock. And I took my watch, and I went to that address, and I found that the real-time clock had no error code set. So I started hunting around in the I.O. region of memory until I found one word that was different between the working watch on the left and the inaccurate watch on the right until I found that at 016E, one of them had the value 0400 and the other had the value 0402. So I could look up what the twos bit meant in order to see what the difference was. And it turns out that this was a failure in the low frequency oscillator. On this device, when the low frequency crystal that is used for timekeeping fails, a resistor capacitor oscillator is immediately substituted by the hardware so that your clock doesn't stop, it just becomes inaccurate as it fails. Knowing this, I could add software support, but thanks to the hex editor, I was able to find the initial problem internally and without having to resort to outside test equipment. There's also a, a power on self-test, which could be handy, but again, we're here to talk about radios, not about Studebakers. So the, the radio in this device can handle um, 300 to 348 megahertz as a low band. It's got 389 to 464 in the middle. And then at the high end, it'll do 779 to 928 megahertz. My initial version was hardware filtered to do 430 to 435 as a way to simplify the design, getting it working on one frequency before worrying about the others. This is the jankiest antenna I have ever manufactured in my entire life. Um, I'm so desperate to replace this that I'm learning how to make jewelry out of silver wires. The, um, the green wire comes out of the watch casing and connects the stainless steel watch band as a random wire antenna to the ChipCon 430 device inside of the watch casing. This is not a good antenna, but you don't need a great antenna. You just need something to get you on the air. And this watch band antenna is more than good enough to get a signal from my watch as I'm sitting on my couch to my doorbell receiver on the far side of the apartment. So I can sit on my couch, I can hit a button on my watch, ring the doorbell, I can um, flip relays, I can um, like reverse engineer all of these cheap uh, radio remote control devices and then re-implement them by software in my own hardware just by virtue of something that's good enough and a copy of a reference design. So the, the first thing that you need when you're adding a radio to this is you need a graceful downgrade so that things still function if the radio isn't populated. In the case of the watch, if you're assembling one of these and you don't need the radio functions or if you work in a skiff, you just leave off the high frequency oscillator that's required by the radio and everything falls back to being just a wristwatch. All of the radio functions cease working uh, you can happily bring it into your skiff while knowing that it's not going to transmit your conversation in Morse code. Um, the other thing that you need, and you absolutely need this, you cannot, you cannot skip on this, you need a way to quickly prototype your radio configuration to know whether you've improved or ruined things or whether you're able to catch the packet. And you need to be able to do that from the command line in Unix without having to um, touch the controls of your physical device. So I made several of these things, which are just a, a regular FTDI chip adapter connected to a good watch board, which then has um, a chip antenna populated on it, so that I can write my radio modules first in Unix and later port them to run standalone. I also have configuration text files so that I can make each watch different. I can give it different frequencies, a different ham radio call sign. Um, and again, we have these power management restrictions, right? So it, if it's like, uh, you know, between 5 and 160 microamps as it's doing software stuff, like we, we really care what the radio stuff costs. And the answer to that is that it costs a bloody fortune. 
it's 15, mi uh, 15 milliamps, 15,000 microamps to receive a packet. And it's about the same to transmit one because you know, we don't have a, a final power amplifier. Uh, the highest that it will consume while transmitting at full strength is 30 milliamps. So quick little demos that transmit something are well within our power budget. We can drain the milliamps from the coin cell in the short term with no consequences. So this is showing the watch transmitting my call sign in Morse code to a waiting uh, 70 centimeter receiver. Um, we used this as a test and were able to get Morse code across a couple of city blocks in Philadelphia. You can also emulate and, and transmit um, remote control messages easily while remaining within your power budget because the milliamps are only consumed as you're holding the button and transmitting the message. You can reverse engineer and clone um, these cheap little um, relay controllers. Uh, they're like 15 bucks. You can get them from many different vendors. They're on off keyed in their transmissions. They're very easy to figure out and re-implement, uh, just as you would do in software defined radio. Um, you grab the recording, you use Universal Radio Hacker or um, you know, your own GNU radio setup, uh, even convert them to an audio file if you like. Um, and then you, you just convert these over to the same radio configuration registers that are documented in the data sheets. So if you need to widen the bandwidth on your, or widen the deviation in your transmission or reduce the bandwidth on your receive filter, all of that is written up in the documentation for you to do yourself. There's no magic here. You can then convert the packets that you see into strings which get sent out the radio. That produces the same signal and then your watch is able to flip the relay or ring the doorbell or whatever else you need to implement. Another handy thing, because again, we're limited in our receive power budget. We're very sharply limited. So one thing that you can do um, that Mike Osmond implemented uh, a while back for a similar chip in the Girltech IM me is a spectrum analyzer. Unfortunately, I don't have the LCD room to display the spectrum analyzer. But I can do the same technique of retuning my radio to many different center frequencies, measuring the receive signal strength indicator on each channel, and this will then tell me where the peak is. So um, if I transmit using my HT on the left at 33.920, the good watch on the right is able to find this just um, 100 kilohertz off at 433.82 which isn't perfect, but it's certainly close enough for you to then tune around with a fancier radio. Um, I successfully used this to find the center frequency of a, a cheap imported walkie-talkie on the left that was running at 450.050. And then at the uh, B-Sides Knoxville conference, um, I managed to uh, use the same trick in order to figure out what the staff radios were running on. Uh, without having to scan, without having to bring out a laptop or a proper spectrum analyzer, without having any equipment on me at all other than uh, like a walkie-talkie and my wristwatch, all while sticking within a three-year expected battery life because the feature is almost always off. There are other forms of communication that you can use when you need to receive more often. Um, POXAG is the... Um, American, or no, the British standard for alphanumeric pagers. Through DAPnet, by ham radio, you're able to get a pager identification number and also wire in your own transmitter to then do amateur radio pages across large areas or within your own home. So I wrote a POXAG receiver for the watch. And POXAG has this nifty little feature that the preamble is 480 milliseconds long, which is ridiculously wasteful if you're trying to do throughput because you have nearly half a second wasted at the beginning of every transmission. But it's really handy because the receiver can wake up three times a second, look to see if the preamble is already on the air. If it is, then the receiver can calibrate its tuning in order to get better range and whatnot, and wait for the rest of the packet to arrive. And if it's not, then the receiver immediately goes back to sleep waiting for its next wake-up interval. And this is how um, 
A cadalphanumeric pager is able to run for months on a AAA battery. I don't have a AAA battery, I have a coin cell, but I'm able to get three days of reception by successfully implementing and measuring the, um, the, the power efficiencies of this, this nifty little protocol. So be thinking about like, um, what nifty tricks are necessary only because of constraints on your implementation. The, the big constraints on the watch are that it has to be comfortable to wear and its battery has to last for years. You're able to make useful radio equipment under those constraints in the same way that you're able to um, solve them in other applications, in the same way that you're able to make a, a Studebaker engine run without radio interference by getting rid of the sparks inside of the distributor. Um, this is strange. I have different versions of the slide in my speaker preview as I have on that display, but they're still kept in sync by the slide number. This is crazy. In any case, um, I have a few hundred of the GoodWatch 30 circuit boards with me. Um, I think the most useful thing that I ever did for GNU Radio as a whole was that I tricked uh, neighbor Osman here into learning surface mount soldering. And I would very much like to trick you into learning surface mount soldering. So um, if you would like, I can give you two of these boards. You can order the components on DigiKey and you can build them at home and then begin building more nifty stuff of your own. Thank you. Anybody in the audience have questions? Oh. Uh, my call sign is Kilo Kilo 4 Victor Charlie Zulu. Except when I'm transmitting out of band when it's Kilo Kilo 4, oh sorry, KK4 VCC. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, Kilo Kilo 4 Victor Charlie Zulu. Um, Other questions for Travis? How, uh, how can people find you to get those boards without swarming you? Oh, um, don't swarm me now, but later today or tomorrow, if you catch me, I'll be carrying them until I run out. All right. Oh, and uh, where, peop where can people find the bomb that they oh, need to? The bomb, the um, schematics, the source code, everything is open source and um, uh, just full public domain, not even GPL, on GitHub uh, at github.com slash Travis Goodspeed. Um, you'll find other projects there, some of them good, some of them not so good. Uh, I have a lovely tool for uh, indexing, uh, for maintaining indexes in very large LaTeX books. Yeah, go and get set up. Which no one uses, but it's very handy. <laughs> All right, thank you, Kyle. Oh, wait, we got, oh. another, got more while Robin gets set up. Right, okay, so the, the question was, um, you know, the, the LCD on this thing is an eight-digit, seven-segment display. It's very limiting. Um, what have I considered to uh, expand upon that or improve it? Um, I did look at custom LCD glass manufacturing. Um, you can order LCDs if you want a few thousand of them. The, the setup costs aren't extreme. And you can order them in the same size, the same shape, and with the same connectors in order to either clone an existing LCD display or to add more segments. In my case, had I done that, I would have been able to use more of the 96 segments that my controller chip can support, but I wouldn't have, able, I wouldn't have been able to fit in significantly more information. Like One extra digit didn't seem to justify the cost of the custom glass manufacturing to me. Um, I did add a Morse code uh, feature through the buzzer so that as I need to tell the time in the middle of the night, I can touch a button on my watch and it will beep the time out to me in Morse code and I don't have to turn the lights on. Um, I've also been experimenting with uh, like a side uh, LED backlight uh, that doesn't exist in the original design. Um, but as you add these things, you still have to fit within what your chip supports and what the hardware supports. And I, I don't think that the original manufacturers left out much room in their LCD design or um, like made any mistakes there that would be valuable to recreate. So, 
All right, thank you. And we'll uh, bounce on to our next speaker. Thank you very much, Travis. Oh, can't leave without your keynote challenge coin. <laughs>